Thank you, Brother John, for the reading. Psalm 138, a wonderful chapter. I want to preach this morning on the subject, Revived in the Midst of Trouble. Revived in the Midst of Trouble. Verse number 7, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. Revived in the midst of trouble. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word. As we read, you've magnified your word above your name, and you high, hold your word in high esteem. Now, Lord, we've come to the preaching of your word. How blessed it is. How powerful it is. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It affects every part of our being, spirit, soul, and body. Lord, your word is blessed. And we know, Lord, that your word as it is sent forth will not return to you void. But Lord, we're praying and claiming that it will accomplish the desires of your heart in our lives this morning. Please bless the preaching of your word. I pray that you'd fill this preacher with your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would help me to say only that which you want me to say, no more and no less. And I pray that you would stir our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that Australia is in trouble. It has to be in trouble. And by the way, the whole world is in trouble. Australia is in trouble morally. I think the morals of Australians today are hitting an all-time low. You don't have to walk too far or hear too much to see that the morals of Australia or Australians is, uh, is depreciating more and more. But not only the morals, I believe even spiritually Australia is in trouble. I believe economically, despite what the government says about this and what the government says about that, I do believe that the economy of Australia is in trouble. You say, wow, this is a really good start to the sermon. Wait, it gets better. <laughs> America is in trouble. Even though they have a wonderful president who's doing amazing things, I believe America is in trouble. I believe America is in trouble in the same way that Australia is in trouble. Would you agree that even spiritually America is in trouble? Absolutely. Now, Donald Trump may be doing some great things on the economy for America and businesses may be opening up and things of that nature. But I still believe despite all of that, America is in trouble economically, financially and spiritually. Canada have re-elected, what's his name? Trudeau. I got it wrong this morning. One of the most liberal prime ministers that you could ever think about. And the Canadians have voted him back in again. Canada's in trouble. Great Britain's in trouble. The EU is in trouble. The whole world is in trouble. And it has to be. It has to be in order for the Antichrist to come. It's not going to get any better. But though we walk in the midst of trouble, we can still experience revival. Amen. Even today. World in trouble, getting set up for the coming of the Antichrist. Now, in the book of Revelation, we won't turn there. There's two beasts that come up out of the ocean. The first is the Antichrist, and he is of a political nature. And when the Antichrist sets up his rule and his reign, he's going to come on the scene and man, he's going to be the best thing since sliced bread. He's got the answer for the world's economy and all this sort of stuff. And people are going to love him and all of that. The second beast is the false prophet. So spiritually, we see that the world's in trouble now. But when the false prophet comes along and joins up with uh, the Antichrist, we're going to see a, uh, a, a political influence on religion. As a matter of fact, it's going to become a, a, a state run, a, a government, a one world government, a one world religion. Uh, let me just say, uh, uh, the things that will be preached in that day, if it's not going to happen now, definitely happen then, will be uh, monitored, it will be uh, vetted. Uh, uh, may even, uh, preachers may even be told in that day what they have to preach. 
So the world is in trouble. And I tell you, bringing children into the world today, we sang that song because he lives. It's like, wow, bringing children in the world today. I'll be perfectly honest with you. If I was starting over again and Tracy and I just got married, I don't know, honestly, and I'm not trying to minimise the might and power of God. Please don't misunderstand me. But when I look at it from a natural perspective, I don't know if I'd want to bring children into a world like this. There was, uh, Tracy was telling me the other day that there was a, a, a you know, custody thing. The child was obviously caught in the middle. The child was, uh, was with his dad and his dad was, he was saying, you, no, the child was saying to the dad, I think, I'm a girl, I'm a girl. And he's a boy, but he's telling the dad, I'm a girl. He's like, no, you're not, you're a boy. No, I'm a girl. Mum was telling him, you're a girl, you're a girl. It's funny when we babysit Blair and he comes over and he likes those bubble things, you know, you, yeah. and you blow in the bubble. And uh, we say, get blue. Blue is for boys. Pink is for girls. We tell him that all the time. Blue is for boys. Pink is for girls. That's the way it used to be. Yeah. It's the way it should always be. Yeah. And then he said, what's the, <laughs> he said, what's the orange ones for? <laughs> <laughs> I sc- scooted around that <laughs> That's the, that's the alternate colour. <laughs> now, you may not agree with this, but I do believe that we have a weak need Prime Minister. Amen. I, I don't think that the Prime Minister in which we have, though he touts that he's a Christian, I do believe he's a weak need Christian. If he has any kind of Christianity in him, why is he not speaking out against the abortion of babies? Why is he not speaking out about this same-sex marriage? Why is he staying silent on these things? Why isn't he being like a... I think Donald Trump speaks out about those things and lets it known that he's pro-life and all of that. And I know it may be even difficult today to reverse those things that have been set in motion and we understand that through the Scriptures, yes, I said, as I said before, it's going to get worse and worse and, and troubling times, no doubt about it. But surely we could have a Prime Minister who says he's a Christian have some sort of guts to get up and speak what he believes. We have a weak-kneed Prime Minister. There's an increasing, there is increasing news. Now listen to this. There's increasing news about transgender people that have changed their sex, whether it be from male to female or female to male, that want to reverse that procedure. And the sad thing about that is that there are many who are committing suicide. And nothing is said. Nothing is said. As a matter of fact, if anything about a transgender person uh, is mentioned about death, it's because uh, it's because there is such a hatred towards those things. Those conservative Christians that get up and preach what they believe, it's those people that are sending people to suicide. No, it's not. They know in themselves Amen. what they are and what they are not. Right. And they make a choice, and that choice is the wrong one, and then they try and correct the choice. But it's hard. It's too late, maybe, for these things to take place. Watched a clip the other day. I think you shared it. Remember that that father that went to his child's school, a primary school, that was displaying art from from matriculation students. And the art was the most blasphemous kind of artwork that you could ever see. (coughs) Drawings depicting Jesus as Ronald McDonald. Oh my goodness. So you know, you know, Ronald McDonald, you know, who, he's a clown. So they're trying to say that Christ is a clown. They have him on the cross, Ronald McDonald on the cross. You know, I think it's Michelangelo's work where God is reclining on the cloud and he's got his big finger and the, and the finger of man and God is, is like this. Well, guess who's the one that's lying on the cloud? Ronald McDonald. So every, every artwork that used to depict Christ, these matriculation students have trained Jesus Christ to Ronald McDonald. And then they had paper mache, uh, head figurines with horns, very demonic. Do you know what those paper mache heads were made out of? Demonic heads were made out of? Scripture. Bibles being cut up and made and formulated into these demonic forms with the horns and all that sort of stuff. Though we walk 
in the midst of trouble. Thou wilt revive me. And we are walking and living in the midst of trouble. Jesus put it this way in Luke twenty two fifty three. But this is your hour and the hour of power. Oh, sorry, this is the hour of power. Do you remember, <laughs> Do you remember the hour of power, old Robert Shuler? <laughs> the hour of power. It, Jesus, let me just say, Jesus said this, this is your hour and the power of darkness. So it shouldn't surprise us the way that the world is going. It shouldn't surprise us the troubles that we are living in the very midst of. But we don't have to allow the trouble to rob us of what God wants to do for us. And he said this, I will revive you in the midst of trouble. Amen. There is hope, listen, there is hope if God's people would do what Second Chronicles 7.14 tells them to do. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Now, let me just stop there for a minute. As I have studied more intently about prayer and fasting, do you know one way that fasting is explained is humbling oneself? I humbled my soul. Psalm 35, 13, David said, I humbled my soul with fasting. So if, if the Bible, if we're going to follow that train of thought and there's nothing wrong with putting that there, if we are going to humble ourselves, that means we're going to have to devote some time to prayer and fasting. He said this, my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Listen, forget the world. You and I can change our lives and what we are going through if we would humble ourselves, fast and pray, seek God, turn from our wicked way, have all our focus. And God said, oh, hear from heaven. Even though it would get worse and worse and worse, you know what? We could be like Israel that lived in the land of Goshen where there was light while there was darkness all in Egypt. We could. If Christians would just become obedient to the word of God. But of course the problem today is that there are very few of us that will actually walk and live according to the word. But if we want to be children of light, walk in the word. If we want to be salt, be in the word. And that's what Jesus tells us to be. We're living in troubled times, but there's still hope. Let me just say a few things. Number one, troubling times has an effect on everybody. Troubling times has an effect on everybody, whether you're saved or lost. Right? But for a saved person, troubling times, if the psalmist says is true and it is, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. So therefore, the effect of trouble is that it, it saps our life. It saps our energy. It makes us lifeless, lethargic. Almost brain dead. How many Christians do we see like that today? Lethargic. No vigor, no life, no fire of God in their life. Why? Because they've allowed the trouble to rob them of what God wants for them. Trouble can drain that from us. But let me just say this. Troubles can be used for our own benefit. I want you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, if you would. The book of Genesis. Just finished Genesis this morning. Genesis 45. If you were to study the life of Joseph. <laughs> I like what Joseph said. I'll just, I'll just read this. In, in, we'll be in 45, just want to read it. In chapter 50, in verse number 19 and 20. Joseph said unto them, that's his brethren, Fear not, for, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good 
to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. And you say, what's so good about that? Well, if you were to look at Joseph's life, when God gave him the dreams when he was 17, I don't think Joseph for one minute thought the first step that I'm going to see in the fulfilment of those dreams is I'll be chucked into a pit. That's pretty troublesome. Then he gets lifted up out of the pit and gets put in pot of his house and, and, and the house was blessed. But then we know the false, false accusations come from pot of his wife and then guess where he ends up? In the prison. But God was with him in the pit, in pot of his house and God was with him in the prison. I think the prison would have been troubling times too. But then God took that and he promoted him to where God wanted him to be over Egypt under Pharaoh had all authority. Now someone said, what way to get to where God wanted him to be? But he used the troubles for Joseph's good. He used the troubles for God's purpose. And so even though we live in the midst of troubled times, there's a purpose for those things. Maybe the purpose for that is to get our eyes upon the Lord and say, Lord, I need reviving in the midst of trouble." But God can take the troubles and turn them in for our good. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Amen. But I want to have a look at this for a minute. Jacob. Look at uh, chapter 45 and verse number 26. The, the, the sons told Jacob, they spoke to Jacob and said, told him saying, Joseph is yet alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father revived. I tell you, a way revival comes when good news is spoken or preached and when people see the goodness of God. Because if you were to look at this, Joseph is a type of Christ. They told him, saying, Joseph is, they told him all the words of Joseph. We could put it this way we preached all the words of Christ. And when the words of Christ are preached and the goodness of God is seen, revival can come to us. Revival. So even though, think about Jacob and the life that he led and the hurt that he faced and the whole ordeal. Will you bereave me of my, because they wanted Benjamin to go down into Egypt and he's lamenting, will you bereave me of my children? And he was, oh, Man, he was in a state. But when they came and spoke all the words of Joseph, and when, when, when Jacob saw the wagons, his spirit revived. Folks, even though we walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. And a way that, that I can help you and the way that Pastor Marsh can help you and the way that Brother John can help you is that when we get up to preach, we preach Christ. Amen. We preach the words of Jesus Christ. We preach the life, the testimony of Jesus Christ. And when we pray and fast and seek God and he manifests his goodness, the preaching and the manifestation of his goodness will revive our spirits. Amen. And it can happen. It can happen. Revival is available to everybody. Have a look at, back at Psalm 138. Revival is available for everybody. Now let me just say this. When I say everybody, I'm talking about every Christian. Because revival is for the believer, isn't it? We, we, often, we often say revival meetings and lost people get saved. I think that's a byproduct of, of revival. The whole thing about God's people being revived is rejoicing in God again. And once we start rejoicing in God again, guess what the outflow of that's going to be? We want to tell others. And when we tell others about this God that we serve, this Saviour that saved us, yes, people get saved. Hey, maybe people are not getting saved because we're not revived. Maybe we're not rejoicing in God enough. Maybe we're too focused on the troubled the times that we're in and it's robbed us. 
But the psalmist said this, look at verse 7 again. He says, though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. There was no ifs or buts with the psalmist. He's saying, you will revive me. So there's an expectation. There should be an expectation on our behalf. May I ask you a question this morning? Did you come to church this morning expecting to receive something? Amen. If you didn't come to church expecting, then you, you're going to go back, go home with nothing. We, our expectation levels need to rise a little bit. Listen, God is good. God is great. God is able. He's, he's shown it in his word that he holds above his name. He has shown us his might and power. He's declared to us what he's able to do. Why are we not expecting great things from God? Have a look at Acts chapter 3, if you would. Acts chapter 3. I love this, I love this passage of scripture about the lame man. Now, we know the account. Peter, Peter and John are going to prayer. Listen, great things happen when God's people go to prayer. Amen. Thank you for that one. Amen, brother. Hey, listen, great things happen when God's people go to prayer. Amen. And we ought to be praying a whole lot more. Amen. Praying and fasting a whole lot more. Can you tell them on that hobby horse? Prayer and fasting. They went to prayer. Verse 1, now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. A certain man was lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes on him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting... To receive something of them. <laughs> His expectations level rose. Look at us. Now he's probably expecting a handout. But if we look a bit further. He got a hand up. <laughs> Everyone's looking for a handout. Instead of a hand up. But he was expecting. Peter says look at us. And he's like. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, silver and gold have we none. Now, I like to slow things down a bit. And I put myself in the frame. If I was the lame man and, and, they, and I'm asking arms, arms, arms. And Peter and John walk by, you know, these two preachers are going to church. And uh, that, that old lame man might think that they are some prosperity preachers like a Joel Osteen or something like that. And they're pretty rich and they're looking, oh, arms, arms. And, and Peter walks up and John says, hey, look at us. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, silver and gold have we none. Oh. But, uh, yeah, and then the expect, like, expectation levels come up again. Even though I don't have the, I've got something for you. Uh, something a whole lot better than money. And his name is Jesus. You see, they didn't come in and say, look at us. And as a matter of fact, he said, he said, it wasn't by our own holiness. And it wasn't our power that gave this man the ability to walk. It was Jesus that did it. But he had an expectation. He didn't get the hand out. Peter put out his hand and said, take my hand, took him by the right hand and lift him up. Because he had expectation. And I think if we had expectation, we would experience in our lives more revival in our personal lives than what we've ever seen before. Forget a worldwide revival. You can have a revival. This church can have a revival. Forget the other churches. What about us? Great passage of scripture. Psalm 143 verse 11. Psalm says, quicken me, make me a light, revive me, O Lord, for thy name's sake, for thy righteousness sake, bring my soul out of trouble. Sometimes we get caught up in it. We get caught up in the trouble. And the psalmist is saying, quicken me, revive me. Bring my soul out of trouble. Ezra chapter 9. Let's have a look at that. Ezra chapter 9. Verse number 8. I would say that Ezra and the crew were facing trouble. 
They had started with the foundation of redoing the temple. Ezra was leading them. Great things were being, uh, being done. And then what happened? They sent people to frustrate their purpose. Can't do that. The governor says you can't do it. Or the boss says the pharaoh says you can't do it. And then they started hounding him and giving him a hard time. And the preachers turned up and started preaching to encourage the people while they were facing troubled times. God give us some preachers that will help God's people in troubled times today. Verse number eight. And now for a little space, grace hath been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in this in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. A little revive. Hey, doesn't need a lot. You know, the thing about God. Number one, God doesn't need a lot of people to work with. The remnant. And God doesn't need to give what we would say a lot of revival. A little, hey, a little is better than nothing. Sometimes we ought to be thankful for the little. Brother Marsh, I say this often, better to do a little than nothing at all. Better, better to knock on a do, a, do a little bit of door knocking than nothing at all. Better to do one block than nothing at all. Better to do two houses than nothing at all to try and get the gospel out there. See, the devil wants you to do nothing. But God said, just a little. Just a little. And in this time of trouble that Ezra and the people were facing, the prophets came. And you look back a few chapters, they preached, they prophesied, they did what they were supposed to do. And their prayer was, you know what, God, a little reviving. And they finished the job. Hey, there is still a job to be done. There's still a work to be done. Jesus has not come back. Some Christians are already acting as if Jesus has come back and they've put their feet up and not doing anything at all. There's still souls to be saved. Whether you can come out door knocking or not, there's still people that you and I come across every day of our life that need a word. God, help us. Let's go back to Psalm 138. Revival is available to every Christian. Now look at this. God's power is manifested in trouble. God's power. We all want God's power, amen? amen. Well, he's not going to give you his power when things are going well. What are you going to do with God's power when things are going well? <laughs> You know, the church was at its best when it was facing trouble. We call it persecution. The trouble brought God's people to their knees. They prayed unto God and God poured out his power. If your house is facing trouble, get on your knees and pray to God and maybe he'll just pour out his power. If our world around us is facing trouble, we can still have the power of God on our life so that he can demonstrate that power. Look at this, verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. So when we see about God's hand here, we're talking about his power. I want to go to one last verse. Oh, no, two scriptures. Isaiah 59, if you would. Isaiah 59. We, we think, honestly, we think that the hand of God has been shortened, but the hand of the Lord has not been shortened. Look at what this verse says. Isaiah 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Now we often interpret the word save for people being saved, but the word save means to deliver from. When we got born again, we were delivered from hell. But how many of us understand that when we're in a world full of trouble, we need to be delivered? 
So the, the, hand, the, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. In other words, the hand, the hand of the Lord is far reaching and is limitless in what it can do. Amen. Shortened, limited. Stretched out, unlimited. So what do you believe about the hand of the Lord? Unlimited. Far reaching. The hand of the Lord came against it. Hey, do we, does the, hey, listen. Do we have enemies? Yeah. Absolutely. And they're increasing. And by the way, because we're Christians, we're enemies. Because Christ is their enemy. It's always been that way. But the Bible says that the hand of the Lord will be stretched out against the wrath of our enemies. We don't have to fear. If we believe in the hand of the Lord. The power of Almighty God against the wrath of our enemies. Yet we fear that when we shouldn't. It's far reaching. It has unlimited abilities. Amen. If we would believe that. One last scripture. Have a look at Matthew 14. Matthew 14. We won't read this whole account. You, you know the account when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water. I love Peter. <laughs> I love his boldness. Lord, is that you? Yep. If it's you, bid me to come on the water. Hey, come. <laughs> See you, fellas. <laughs> and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. That's a miracle. That is amazing. But, but, we know it so well, don't we? Verse 29, he said, Come, and when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, there's some trouble, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. You see, the hand of the Lord is not shortened and it cannot save. The hand of the Lord is not short. And he caught him and said unto him, and gave him a little bit of a touch up. O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Why did you doubt? We're all like that, aren't we? Come on. When we're in the midst of the storm, we've got troubles all around us. Oh, Lord! And he, he cried out and immediately he stretched forth. Now, if the hand of the Lord was shortened, Peter was gone. He's gone. But you see, it's not shortened. It has far reaching. Whatever the trouble, whatever the issue, whatever the problem, the hand of the Lord can reach out and touch you, grab you right where you're at. How many of you this morning? If you were search your heart, would say these troubling times, the things of life that we're going through, I've allowed it to sap me of my energy. My spirit just seems flat. I don't have any vigor, any life. There's no fire of God in my soul. If you're like that, then you need to claim the fact that he will revive you. Because though we walk in the midst of trouble, thou will revive us. His hand will be against our enemies. His hand will save, it will deliver, because he is Christ. Amen. And no one else can do that. No one else can do that. So do you need reviving this morning? Do you need a touch from God this morning? Well, if you do, why don't you come to the altar? Why don't you sit where you're at if you want and pray and expect and ask God for a revival? I'm just going to try and find a song. Four, 541. 541. Let's stand if you're able to. 541. Set my soul afire, Lord. Set my soul afire. Do you need that this morning?
I know we're only few in number, but maybe there's someone here today that you need God to set your soul on fire. You need some reviving in your heart. As we sing, why don't you come to the altar? Why don't you do business with the Lord this morning? One, two, three. Set my soul afire, Lord, for thy home.